What do you think of when you hear the term carnivorous plant? Do you think of a Venus flytrap? Do you think of a little shop? Or is it something else entirely? For some, carnivorous plants are more than just a novelty. They can mean profoundly different things to different people. Throughout 2016, I captured glimpses of the lives of four people who have been affected in different ways by their cultivation of these fascinating plants. Perhaps in watching, you too will find a new appreciation for these plants and have them inspire you as well. New York in the winter is probably not the first thing you associate with carnivorous plants. But even here, in the Empire State, we can embark on a journey to see how these captivating plants can engender livelihood, art, community, and discovery. We begin at a small nursery on Long Island. My name is Eric Kunz. I am a proud owner of Seymour Carnivorous Gardens, which is located on North Shore of Long Island, just about dead center on the island. I was born and raised in Port Jefferson. Uh, my interest in carnivorous plants started when I was about 10 years old. That's when I was initially exposed to them. Like everybody, the first plant that I was exposed to was the incredible Venus flytrap. And who doesn't love that plant? It's just an amazing plant. Anything that moves and traps its prey is phenomenal. And I stumbled upon these plants when I was about 10 years old uh, down in Yapank, New York. And at that time, these plants were everywhere. There were pitcher plants, there were sundews, there were butterworts in the water, there were frogs and turtles, and it was just absolutely phenomenal. I was actually born into the industry. My parents owned Kunz Greenhouses and Nursery up in Port Jefferson which uh, has been in continuous operation now for over 55 years. And from the day I was born, I have been involved in all aspects of horticulture. In fact, mom says the day I was born, the next day I was out pulling weeds. It's a wonderful industry and it was a family business and we spent every waking hour together learning about the wonders of nature and the beauty of it. And I spent all of my years, my younger years, uh, up with, in the garden center up until I was about, about 25 or so is when I finally left. But prior to that, it was a retail garden center and I was involved in every aspect of it from the, the marketing to the designing to the potting up of the plants. When I reached into my late 20s, I needed to spread my wings a little bit and explore a little bit more in the industry. So with a saddened heart, I left the business and uh, over the course of 35 years have explored everything from landscape design uh, to running to working at wholesale nurseries uh, over in uh, Dix Hills. And I decided to make a dramatic change in career choices and become a full-time carnivorous plant grower. Seymour Carnivorous Gardens was founded uh, back in 2006. It was a hobby that grew continuously, and I was able to take the wonder of beautiful carnivorous plants and incorporate this into my livelihood, which originally started off as a landscape designer. I had a good idea of what I wanted to do and where I wanted to go with it, but getting there, there was no clear path. 
it became obvious to me that the only way that I was going to be able to make this business viable was to do it on my own and create my own unique brand of plant. Eric devotes a substantial portion of his nursery to the cultivation, propagation, and sale of Saracenia. Saracenia are the North American family of temperate pitcher plants. These plants form cup-shaped leaves called pitchers, which are both photosynthetic and capable of trapping and digesting prey. Some species form upright pitcher leaves called trumpet pitchers. Other species form recumbent pitchers that rest on the ground. Carnivorous pitchers attract and catch prey through several methods. Several species produce sweet secretions near the mouth of the pitcher, while other species exhibit bright white patterning that can be backlit by the sun. Curious and hungry insects slip off the waxy surface of lip or the underside of the lid into the body of the pitcher, where three mechanisms prevent escape. First, a waxy interior surface is slippery enough to prevent climbing. Second, the shape of the pitcher prevents winged insects from achieving lift, no matter how hard they flap. And third, large hairs on the interior surface of the lid point down toward the mouth of the pitcher, presenting a formidable obstacle for insects trying to climb out. Regardless, the pitcher produces a digestive enzyme that washes over the trapped insects, digesting their innards and absorbing the nutrients. The plant stores this energy in a bulb-like structure called a rhizome. These temperate plants go dormant in winter, all but ceasing photosynthesis. When the growing season returns, the plant draws on the stored energy of the rhizome to produce new leaves. However, even these incredible plants aren't enough to make the early years of Eric's nursery run smoothly. And I would say for the first, honestly, the first seven years of being a grower, I was hanging on by a thread. Uh, Bills were barely getting paid. There was a lot, a lot of stress involved in it uh, because it took so long to grow the plants. And the market wasn't a fixed market. It's, this is a want, not a need. And I needed to turn people's mindset around and make them a need, want to need this and not just want it, but to need it because it served a purpose in the environment. So it was an uphill struggle. And the business almost faltered quite a few times. There was some very, very bad seasons and it's a very short season. You know, the plants only wake up in like late April, May, and for the most part by November, by mid-November, the plants are dormant. So you have six months really to, to make a living where everybody has 12 months of a year to do it, plus vacation times and all, and that didn't happen in this industry. To this day, it is a struggle. Uh, because it requires a lot of energy and the market is constantly changing. From what I started off growing uh, pitcher plants, the industry is now slowly changing back over to Venus flytraps is where there's a lot of interest. So you never quite know, it's, it's always different. But the pitcher plants are the primary focus of the Saracena of Seymour Carnivorous Gardens. That is the bread and butter plant for me. I'm growing these plants and I'm trying to find a way to make a living at it. And what I found was that by doing craft fairs and events, I was able to reach a very, very broad market of exposure every weekend, as I have been doing for the past 10 years, would go out and do events. Uh, and the average year, I would probably do about maybe 200 events. So it's, it's a phenomenal amount of energy that goes into it. So these plants are phenomenal in where they've taken me in life. They've shown me things that, even inside myself, that I never knew I, I was capable of doing. My name is Matthew Uncallen. Uh, as a child, I was really interested in creepy crawlies of any sort, and I had discovered carnivorous plants, and I was just enthralled right away with them. Let's see, 1999, I was taking an art class in Europe and a friend of mine who had said, hey, you know, I know you're into this kind of thing, check out this book. And that was my introduction to the Savage Garden. And he gives me this book and I just must have read it like backwards and forwards on this trip. So it was moving back to Long Island uh, for work that 
I started really coming into the first challenges of growing carnivorous plants because you can't leave them outside during the winter time, they're gonna freeze to death, except for maybe the ones that go dormant, but a lot of the ones I had were tropicals. I do continue to be passionate about all the carnivorous plants that I've grown, and I look forward to growing other genus that I haven't grown yet. I was never really into photography when I was younger. I had a Polaroid camera, which was cool and it was fun, but it was the carnivorous plants first. I was growing these plants, and I love these plants, and they're fantastic plants, and um, the idea was to photograph the plants in a way that brings out their beauty. And again, a very evolutionary process because at first what I'm doing is just kind of photographing, photographing them in interesting ways, uh, sometimes taking close-ups, focusing on one of their traps in particular, and then kind of like, you know, like my art background starts taking over and then you start kind of composing the photograph or using the right angle or, or focusing on the right spot. Uh, as like the evolution continued of the photography, then I started getting into the production of the photographs and kind of looking for uh, places to exhibit. I did a couple of like small exhibits with the New England Carnivorous Plant Society for their exhibitions. But then I would say the first big exhibition was probably still my, one of the biggest ex exhibitions that I've done, which is at Yes Gallery in Brooklyn. Uh, towards the end of 2014, that's where I began working on the book. And from that point forward up until now, it was basically everything. Every ounce of my energy was put into this book. And as an artist, one of the things I'm a fan of doing is you kind of take a toolbox and you dump it onto a table and you sift through it and you see what you can use for your project. The book, it was in itself like an art project. It's kind of like three separate parts, but they're all kind of uh, they're tied together between the art photography and the background of the art photography is the cultivation, how I grew these plants. Because all the photographs that you're going to see in this book are plants that I grew myself personally. These are not of someone else's plants or at a botanical gardens or anything like that. Photography was new and that was difficult enough to pick up a new trade, uh, a new technique. Now writing was another new technique where I just didn't just write dry information. I wanted to craft it. So that's kind of what I try, wanted to convey with this, with the writing of the book. It's not just the images, it's, it's the information with the images. You look at a lot of books out there and it's either a picture book or it's an information book. And I kind of wanted to like, well, if you have the photographs anyway, you should fill it out with good, solid information. Uh, information that really applies to what you're looking at and also in a very engaging and interesting way. So where the book is right now, um, it's done, it's out of my hands, and I love that fact. So now they're preparing it for production, for printing. Uh, I hope to get the advanced copy in a few weeks, and then I have my book, fantastic. Well, it's not over yet. They still have to produce it, you know, to, to fill to fill the warehouse basically and to ship it to the distributors. For now, it's really like focusing on the book to bring up awareness of the project that I'm working on, but also just to share the experience, to share the beauty that I see with these plants. This is my project. This is expressing what I, what I do, what I see, what I feel. And um, I just hope people like it. Well, my name is Jonathan and I'm the general nighttime manager at a restaurant in Manhattan. I collect video games and I grow carnivorous plants. I was born in Brooklyn and raised in the Bronx and uh, I studied biological sciences at the University of Vermont, but I came back after college to work in the city. I first learned about carnivorous plants in AP Bio in high school. I was a sophomore and my teacher brought all these plants into the classroom and he told us that they were all carnivorous plants but he gave each table a different plant and we were uh, supposed to come up with uh, what adaptations this plant has to capture insects and I thought that was really cool. But what cemented uh, carnivorous plants as a hobby for me was that same year, the same teacher gave us uh, 
extra credit assignment to go to the reptile expo and at the show I actually brought a bunch of carnivorous plants. They died soon after, but it was the first time I've ever brought carnivorous plants before. So I think uh, that class really helped me get into the carnivorous plants. Jonathan's fascination with carnivorous plants leads him to cultivate a collection of pinguicula plants, which he maintains indoors throughout the year. The pinguicula are a family of carnivorous plants, commonly known as butterworts. These plants form rosettes of fleshy, carnivorous leaves that are often mistaken for succulents. The surface of each leaf is covered in a lawn of small, stalked glands, each of which produces a sticky droplet until the surface of the leaf glistens. Small insects are attracted to the droplets, believing that they may be water or nectar. The droplet sticks to the insect, and as it struggles, nearby droplets cover the insect in warm mucilage until it is unable to move. The digestive enzymes produced by the glands digest the insect's innards, absorbing the nutrition through the surface of its leaf, leaving behind only the shell. More than half of pinguicula species are endemic to Mexico and Central America, where they are believed to have originated. While those species are tropical, temperate species are also found throughout Europe and North America. Some species form non-carnivorous leaves in the winter, while others form winter resting bodies known as hibernocula. While their carnivory may be fascinating, these plants are often cultivated for their colorful and long-lasting flowers, which resemble miniature orchids. Despite his thriving collection of pinguicula, Jonathan's deeper interests lie not with the butterworts, but rather with the carnivorous pitcher plants, beginning with the tropical Nepenthes and later shifting to North American Saracenia, like these. So in college, I was actually walking through the halls of the science department. I find this guy and he has a bunch of Nepenthes in a tank. And I go in and I start talking to him. I say, hey, are those carnivorous plants? He gets really interest, interested in the story of, you know, my interest. And he tells me that there's a professor at the college studying Saracenia. The great thing about the University of Vermont is that there was opportunities for undergraduates to do research with professors. And so I started doing research with Nicholas Catelli uh, the summer of my freshman year. Uh, after college, I really missed that sense of community, and so I was looking to join uh, communities online. So other forums are, you know, really big, and they sort of have too many things going on to get into the nitty-gritty, which is why I wanted to create the Saracenia forums. And uh, when I did, it was very slow going. I created the forums, I posted links on Facebook, I looked for other people who were into carnivorous plants and I invited them to join. But because the community there was so small, uh, in the beginning, nobody wanted to join. It's just the content on the forum wasn't there. That was the major problem. After a few months, I forgot the forum existed, <laughs> the forum I created. And uh, eventually I received a very, interesting message from this guy named Mike Wang. His collection, I think, is one of the best genetic preservations of plants. He was very interested in helping grow the forum. He was looking for a community of, you know, people who love Saracenia. And he was wondering if I could make a few changes to the forum to make it better. And so we split the plant pick section into species and different things. He started posting pictures of plants in the wild and different things from his collections. Very quickly after Mike started posting his awesome collection, loads of people started coming into the forum and I started thinking, hey, maybe we can do something more. We don't have to just sit around and share information and trade plants. Uh, perhaps we can also help plants in the wild. And so we looked into creating a forum t-shirt and we donated all the profits uh, to an organization chosen by the forum. Uh, the second year we did the t-shirt and Saracenia purpurea was chosen. Uh, the sales weren't as much as the first year, but it was still successful. We still donated uh, money to Meadowview Biological Research Station. Uh, for the second year of the t-shirt sales, we had the first auction. And that went very well. Um, the North America Saracenia Conservancy actually helped us set up the auction. I had never done an auction before and I had all these concerns in my head like so many things could go wrong here. In my head I was very nervous. Thanks to people who donated some rather expensive plants we were able to raise a good amount of money for them. 
eventually my ultimate goal for the forum would be to set up a Sarasinia genetic preserve that really helps propagate the plants and keeps sort of a genetic library of plants. Let's say you have a Sarasinia collection and eventually you're not going to be here and your plants still might. What happens to those plants? You know, do they get divided amongst 10, 20, 30 people? Or do you, you know, give it to a botanical guardian which might not have the resources to care for them? I think the best way to care for those plants would be for those plants to go into a preserve and to be cared for with a long-term goal, no matter who's in charge of the preserve. The same goal would be to preserve the genetics of these plants and to make them available to people in the form of seeds and the form of divisions and such. So I think for a noble cause for the forum, that would be the best thing we could possibly do. Uh, currently, we're just working on education, rise, uh, raising money for conservation and that sort of stuff. Yeah, everybody on the forum just has like a really friendly community-based attitude. It doesn't matter if your question is what species or hybrid is this or a more advanced question like, hey, my seedlings just germinated, when can I first fertilize and what kind of fertilizer should I use? Everybody's there just to help and to, you know, lift everyone else up. Uh, my name is Ivan. I was born in Argentina in 2000 in Buenos Aires, and then my family moved over to the United States. So my dad, Etienne, he works in finance. My mom, Gabriela, she's a psychologist, and both my sister and I, obviously, we go to school. She's in eighth grade, I'm in 10th grade, and I go to Bronx High School of Science. Uh, well, I always liked science, specifically plants, since I was a little child. I always enjoyed germinating like beans and wet paper towels. I always enjoyed growing plants, and I thought that was really interesting. And I'm also a volunteer at a place called Earth Matter, which is a compost learning center in Governor's Island. We gather food scraps from around the island, uh, compost them, and then use the compost for gardening. And then we also have animals there, which I take care of, goats, chickens, and also bunnies. But it's just open space, there's no cars or anything, so it's really peaceful and relaxing. I always like enjoyed growing some plants, I always had some plants in my house. I'm the plant guy, usually it's my family trying to tolerate all the things I do related to plants. Well, I think I always knew like that Venus flytraps existed, like some vague memory, but I never really had them present. Uh, but uh, that changed in sixth grade, and I found this book on carnivorous plants. It was pretty simple, the vocabulary wasn't advanced or anything. But immediately I found them really interesting, the Venus flytraps. So from there on I started investigating and that's when I got my first Venus flytrap. So for my birthday I asked my aunt for one. So I got a bristletooth Venus flytrap which has the short hair, short cilia, and then plays the Venus flytrap on my windowsill and that's how it all started. And most people who start growing carnivorous plants start off with a Venus flytrap. I mean, it's the one that displays the most movement. Everybody likes seeing the traps closed. And then my next one was an Nepenthes. Uh, it was a pretty big plant. It arrived in the mail. And the grower who originally, who I bought, I got it from, grew it in a greenhouse with high humidity. So I was sort of worried it wouldn't do well on the windowsill. But uh, it started off as a short plant, but right now it's finding all across my windowsill. It's over three feet long and it's flowered, I've gotten seeds from it, and I still have it after about four, three years. The book start, sparked my interest in carnivorous plants, but from there on I went to the internet and from there started researching different species, different types of plants to care for them. And, but from there on eBay, I kept, I started buying different plants and I got my first Drosser, which was a Drosser tokiensis, which I still have. Uh, well, I spend a lot of time on carnivorous plant forums, uh, and people always post pictures of their plants, so I'd always look through pictures of people's plants with lights and everything. I'd be like, wow, that plant is really cool, I want to get that one. And then I would look into that plant and like, research about it and see like, oh, maybe that one's not the best, like, given like, the setup I have. Now to keep on looking and like that, I would just keep on finding species that I'm interested in, like look up the care and then see if I could actually own it and from there see if I could actually purchase one. I enjoy propagating plants a lot. Uh, it's one of the most enjoyable things about growing carnivorous plants, especially the different species, there's different methods and the way they grow. It's really fun to be able to just create new plants out of one single plant. 
So if you have one plant, purchase it and be able to have 10 plants, say, a few months later. And the different ways different plants can be propagated is also interesting how some methods work with some plants and some don't with others, despite like the similarities between them. And I'm trying to grow a bunch of seeds right now. I have a bunch of seeds trying to germinate. So if, uh, when they all grow, I'll probably have easily over 300 plants, I'd say. Over the past few years, my family and I have taken a few excursions to see carnivorous plants. Uh, the first one we took was to Florida. Uh, we, we often go there just for vacation, but I was doing some research on where you can see carnivorous plants in the wild. And I knew you could see Venus flytraps only in North and South Carolina in that area. But I found out that in Florida, there's a certain Saracenia, Drosera, um, Pinguicula, and some Utricularia. So we decided to go uh, some place in the middle uh, where we were able to see Drosera capillaris, Saracenia minor, and some Pinguicula and Utricularia species as well. Well, just in general, I hope my plant collection grows. I'm trying to acquire some more um, South American Drosera and hopefully some other Nepenthes. <laughs>
While there exists only one species of Venus flytrap, cultivated varieties, or cultivars, have been developed with distinct characteristics. Some are chosen for their large trap sizes, others for their distinct color. Variations in leaf structure can also be found, as can variations in cilia formation. Severely deformed mutants have also been isolated, and the others contain different combinations of those characteristics. As with most carnivorous plants, mature Venus flytraps produce flowers in the spring, and if fertilized, these yield seed later in the season. I have some events lined up with libraries right now. Uh, they're always a lot of fun and a couple of schools. Uh, the schools, there's been a little change in their programs. Uh, we won't get into all the details, but everything is dynamic. You guys having a good day so far? Yeah. yeah. You guys all ready for a really cool and exciting seminar on diverse plants? And that's the cool thing about this business is that there's so many avenues and so many things that you can do. Uh, if something starts to falter a little bit, there's always something else you can do. You just uh, keep an open mind and follow what people are, you know, listen and follow what people are talking about and network. Now, between now and June, are they actually producing enzymes and the liquid in there? Is there anything in, to, in there now? To a point. That really starts once they start trapping the insects. Uh, and also it requires moisture at the same time. And that's why these plants... Um, I think carnivorous plants are a wonderful process. teaching They're tool. Extremely... Well, teachers have always used plants in the classroom but there's something about the carnivorous plants that the students are really intrigued about. They're fascinated. They're fascinated about their carnivorous mechanism, um, just the beauty of them, the way they look. They're different, and so that helps to draw them in. It's so interesting. The students come in interested. They want to know about how things work, how the world works, and um, so it, it's intriguing to them. They, they have this natural um, interest in science. I think most students do. Uh, well, I just finished a seminar over at the Brentwood Middle High School. Uh, we had 10 research students who were very interested in the Saracenas, the, uh, the pitcher plants. And it was an absolutely amazing event. Uh, great questions from the students. We had a bog garden here that was put in about two years ago, and they actually asked me to quadruple the size of it. So that's one of the reasons why I do these events is this is how I keep the business viable. Uh, everything leads into something else bigger and better. And that's the name of the game when you're growing carnivorous plants. With a little changing in my schedule, I actually spend more time here at the nursery, which is working out better because now entire families are coming in here and not just one or two people that you meet at a show or something like that. So the public awareness of these plants and of my business is growing uh, very nicely right now. By dialing it down and relaxing a little bit with it and working on different revenue streams and a way of making bog guards and things of that nature, I was able to get the, the joy of the, uh, the business back again. So it's really, it's very, very exciting. It's actually the 10th year of, of business. It's an anniversary for the business this year. So it's kind of cool that this whole filming is going on because it is a uh, milestone in this business right now. So uh, it's very, very interesting, and I can't wait to see what's gonna be coming my way. Okay, yeah, so, the, uh, so since February, that was when I was wrapping up the book. The final edits and the final corrections, final uh, layout placements, uh, a lot of work in a short amount of time. It all came together beautifully. I'm really happy with the way the book came out. Not much longer after that, I got my author advanced copy, got the book in my hands, the physical book in my hands, got to open it up and read it, and that was really a rewarding moment for the whole process of making the book. Uh, to getting to see how, how it came out, and I really love it, and I think it looks great. It's uh, what I intended to do. There's always like, eh, maybe I could have did this a little differently or that, but overall, you have to keep in mind that uh, you can't keep changing things forever. You, you have, there's a point where it has to be 
this is it. The official release date was May 28th. Uh, I think the first ones were being shipped as of June 1st or, or around that. And since then, you know, the book's been released. More and more places are carrying it. Um, seems to be doing well. It's not just a, um, a book about, uh, about carnivorous plants specifically. It's not a book uh, about how to grow them specifically. It's really uh, an art collection. And the cultivation shows how I cultivated all the specimens myself that I photographed. None of these are from, uh, from a botanical gardens or anything like that. These are all plants I uh, uh, grew myself for, for a long time and photographed. For anyone that has seen the book, there's also the um, quick breakdown of Long Island's carnivorous plants, but really it's about beautiful photography of the plants in their natural habitats with daylight as opposed to in the studio. Uh, it's, it's the two opposite ends of the spectrum with the photography. With going to these habitats and photographing them, I would also make observations and um, write them up into sort of reports and send them off to contacts with uh, conservation organizations uh, so they can use them for their records to kind of track you know, how they're doing and how they kind of fit in uh, the historical perspective of you know, are they per, um, persisting or are they disappearing? And in some cases, yes and no in both of those uh, questions. Uh, well, we're in one of the ponds that are part of the Long Pond Greenbelt in Bridgehampton. And there's a number of organizations that are involved with the preservation of this land. As you can see from the sign, there's a nature conservancy. They own this land. Um, there's uh, Friends of the Long Pine Greenbelt and uh, the South Fork Natural History Museum. These are uh, ponds that were formed from glacial processes. And uh, they're very unique habitats. Very sandy, very shallow, and uh, all sorts of really rich biodiversity going on in here. And what we're particularly looking for are carnivorous plants, of course. And in this spot, you'll see all three of the sundews that are native to Long Island, which are uh, Drosera rotundifolia, Drosera intermedia, and especially Drosera filiformis. Uh, Drosera filiformis, is, they're not nearly as widespread as, as the other two. In fact, pretty, yeah, pretty rarely you know, encountered and they're very particular about their habitats, and this is really one of the best habitats you're gonna see for these plants. Drosera, commonly known as sundew plants, are found on every continent except for Antarctica. The plants produce leaves with stalked tentacles, upon each of which is a gland. These glands produce a sweet, sticky chemical droplet that attracts nearby insects. Lured insects attempt to take a drink and get partially coated by this syrupy secretion. The leaf then bends more tentacles toward the captured prey, as demonstrated here with a freeze-dried bloodworm. The struggling insect becomes more coated in the syrupy chemical, preventing flight and movement. The glands secrete a digestive chemical, which dissolves the innards of the insect, with the nutrients absorbed into the leaf. The remaining shell is eventually washed away in the rains. Some species are tropical, growing year-round. In Australia, a number of species have been termed pygmy sundews. These species grow to a far smaller size, many of which are smaller than a coin. However, in the winter, only the pygmy sundews form modified leaves called gemme, which resemble green seeds. When disturbed, these gemme shoot out of the center of the plant. Those that land on suitable ground can grow into a clone of the original plant. Yet other Drosera species are temperate, growing exclusively in warm seasons, receding into a hibernaculum for the winter, and resuming growth in the spring, like the Drosera found here. Uh, so just this area just a few years ago was all underwater, and there were no um, threadleaf sundews to be seen. But as you can see, this year, there are fully grown um, flowering individuals all over the place. So uh, that kind of shows that Although they may be inundated underwater, they'll survive and then they'll come back when the, uh, the water levels drop and it becomes a little bit drier. And 
And uh, what we're looking at here at the, at the bottom of the valley is a, a swale and the sand at the bottom of the swale stays permanently wet and there's a uh, cranberry bog there with the stars of the show of course are the carnivorous plants and this is really one of the greatest habitats for the threadleaf sundew Drosera filiformis that's what we're here to see today And most of the time what I do is I use manual focus for all my photos, but in this case it's eh, just for fun. <laughs> and now is just getting to be the first uh, signings and presentations that I'm doing. And there's going to be more in the future. So this is kind of like another uh, milestone in the journey and a major milestone since the last update. I mean, a lot's happened but, uh, between now and then. And for the, uh, for the next update, I'm sure there will be a lot that has happened since, and we'll see where this whole thing goes. With the growing season in full swing, we find Eric at the Nyack Fair, one of the nearly weekly street fairs and events where Seymour Gardens participates as a vendor. Things are going outstanding here. We're at the Nyack Street Fair here up in beautiful Nyack, New York. Uh, the weather is outstanding. As you can see, it's packed with people. Uh, a lot of interest as always, and we're just having an absolutely fantastic day. I would say we're on the way to record-breaking day here uh, with the sheer volume of people we're speaking with. It's fantastic. That's why I do it. Love it. Excuse me. Uh, so here we are in, in the Pine Barrens of Long Island and there's a series of ponds that are unconnected to any um, rivers or streams or anything like that. There's these isolated ponds. They tend to be fairly shallow with very gently sloping um, shorelines. Even small fluctuations of water can um, expose the shoreline or cover it up with water, but it tends to be very stable which is great for carnivorous plants, and they love it. And those are also great uh, breeding grounds for dragonflies and tiger salamanders and other uh, amphibians and the such. Uh, and so at these ponds that we're looking at today, we're looking more for Utricularia, the bladderworts. Although this year, 2016, is a very dry year. Because of that, there may not be as many uh, of the representative species uh, but they're still fan reliably fantastic spots to, uh, to see various forms of utricularia, and, and that's what we'll be seeing today. The bladderworts, or utricularia, are a diverse family of carnivorous plants, which, like Drosera, are found on nearly every continent. Different species may be either aquatic, terrestrial, or even epiphytic. The plants produce long stems, called stolons, Photosynthetic shoots grow from these stolons, as do carnivorous structures called bladders, mostly found beneath the surface of the water or wet ground. The bladders are tiny trap chambers produced by the plant that are constantly under negative pressure. When a small organism brushes against trigger hairs near the trap's opening, the trap snaps open and shut in a fraction of a second. During that time, the negative pressure sucks in the surrounding water and nearby triggering organisms into the trap, where digestive enzymes dissolve the organism and the nutrients are absorbed into the plant. Meanwhile, the trap pumps water out, resetting the negative pressure for the trap to be triggered by more prey. Different species produce traps of different sizes with some aquatic species producing traps large enough to capture small tadpoles. Some aquatic species are temperate, forming winter resting bodies called terrians, from which the plant reemerges in the spring. Like its distant relatives, the pinguicula, utricularia, produce colorful flowers on stalks, akin to orchids or snapdragons, and are often a motivation for cultivators of these species. So 
what we have here is one little pocket, uh, a deeper area where some of the water is still remaining. And there's all these utricularia purpurea just kind of crowded in here. And all the rest of this area, which is all dried up, as you can see, usually is all underwater. So here's a, a pond system that's nearby a uh, abandoned cranberry farm. It's mostly like a, a saturated peat underneath the water, very mucky, where you see the tricularia gibba here. And on the floating bog itself, there's just great populations of Saracenia purpurea. Uh, it's really something to see. Hey, so we're here now at the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens. I come here like three or four times a year. They have a really nice display in the conservatory of different Saracenia. And out here outside the conservatory, they have like these pots of Saracenia uh, like floating in their waterfall fixture. So the base is a cocoa core. So that's a byproduct of the coconut water industry. It's just the, the fuzzy husk on the outside of the coconut, basically, um, stuffed into these logs. Last time we spoke about the auction, um, it had just started. And so now the auction is over. It's been over for a few months, actually. And we raised uh, money for the Nature Conservancy in Alabama to help uh, with some projects they had over there to actually help some rare forms of Saracenia purpurea um, at one of their sites. Also, we had our t-shirt sales for this year, which uh, did actually really, really great because a lot of other organizations had like put it on their listservs and emailed it out to people that we were selling shirts for the Saracenia Forum. And so it was actually one of the best years for the t-shirts. Uh, the forum's been really busy. It's actually been very busy. A lot of the members have been posting a lot of pictures this year, more than ever, of their different varieties and plants. and. A lot of people have actually been posting very strange things like companion plants. A lot of different types of lilies and orchids have been posted this year, so it's really exciting. And we have a lot of new members as well. Um, people from different plant organizations have joined and just from all over the world. We're still planning on doing our October seed event next month. so. Hopefully a lot of seed will be given away on the forum like it was last year. I think we had like over 50 different people winning seed packets last year. So that's still coming up and that's very exciting because who doesn't like free stuff? On the Saracenia forum, we encourage uh, the people growing Saracenia to, if they don't have any plants for their flowers, then instead of cutting the flower stalks off, let them stay open, let them pollinate, either pollinate it themselves or open pollinate, and give the seed away to people on the forum if they don't have any plans for it. So it's a great way for a beginner to start um, Saracenia from scratch and to find, you know, new varieties because, you know, seeds are the best way, you know, to get new and interesting varieties. You don't know what you're going to get, so it's, it's kind of fun. Uh, right now it's uh, the beginning of September. Uh, school is about to start tomorrow actually. And during the summer I traveled to Argentina, visit family, and then went to Mexico for a week for a vacation. Uh, my plants actually did very well despite the fact that I was away for almost half the summer. Um, my highland plants, despite the heat, they all did very well. So I'm actually pretty surprised with how well they did, but they're all growing well now. Uh, I also planted seeds a few months ago of Drosera tocayensis, sesifolia. Uh, got, I also have some Venus flytrap seedlings. Most of those, 
I bought a few online, Cecifolia and the Venus Flytrap, I won from a giveaway. But then I also sowed my own Tokoyensa seeds and also planted some Nepenthe seeds. And right now I have Nepenthes by Calcarata germinating. I always want to grow more plants, but I have to consider that I live in a fairly small apartment and they take a lot of space. So I have to see what my parents allow and what I can manage to grow or propagate. I mean, I'm always looking to get more, but hopefully at the show this weekend, I'll be able to pick up one or two. It's the weekend of the annual New England Carnivorous Plant Show in Massachusetts. Jonathan and Yvonne meet for the first time in Union Square, Manhattan, to begin the long journey. Annual NECPS show presents hundreds of carnivorous plants each year, including Saracenia pitcher plants, Drosera sundews, Pinguicula butterworts, Utricularia bladderworts, Aldrovanda, the waterwheel plant, Cephalotus, the Australian pitcher plant, Heliamphora, the marsh pitchers, the carnivorous bromeliads, Dionea, Venus flytraps, and Nepenthes, tropical pitcher plants. The uh, carnivorous plant display itself came out better than I had imagined. I mean, transporting them in, in the vehicle, bringing them to the location, and putting it all together and building it there on the spot, and then being able to break it all down and, and move it back and get it out of there. Hi, I'm Ryan George of Native Exotics. Uh, welcome to our display here at the Tower Hill Botanical Garden Society. We brought lots of Nepenthes, as you can see here. We do have some other carnivorous plants available as well. Um, this is going to be a fantastic event in uh, Boylston, Massachusetts. Uh, so far, I've picked up uh, Nepenthes Irulana, uh, Trocata by Thirelia, and uh, Novata by Ventrosa. Hi, I'm H. Grace. Uh, welcome to the NECPS show. Lots of vendors, uh, vending some plants today, some books that I wrote as well, and uh, hope you guys have a good time here. As the show settles into the afternoon, Matt Kalin takes the stage to discuss his book, The Sinister Beauty of Carnivorous Plants. <laughs> but this is really like uh, an artistic look at carnivorous plants, artistic photography uh, in the main. And uh, this is a macro photograph of uh, Drosera regia, the king sun which is really fantastic sundew from South Africa. And you can see how it has these great droplets. And one of the things I like in particular about the hand, the uh, title is um, Flurry Movements and the Elegant Dance with Death. But you have these great, you know, very dramatically lit and composed pieces kind of thing, where you have the driftwood that kind of, that creates the movement. It's, it's meant to symbolize kind of the movement of the wind, so it kind of gives the idea that wind is kind of flowing through the piece. There's the river stones, which so I start taking photographs, and then it starts looking at me. 
and I guess it's still alive. And then you can see how its arms unfolds its arms and it starts kind of waving them around. And I can almost hear in a tiny little voice him saying, Yep, me, yep, me. Another question in the back? Um, I apologize if I missed it, but for those photos that you take with the black backdrop, are uh -huh. you using like any specific lighting or something to light them up? Those are just like amazing photos. <laughs> Thank you, but you're asking my secret formula. Oh. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, actually. No, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a black backdrop. Yeah. Um, so later in the presentation, you had shown a dragonfly that just looked completely helpless. Mm -hmm. But in this photograph, on the top, towards the left, there's a small fly. You hadn't mentioned the fly when you showed the photograph, but I was wondering if that was something that was purposely put in there, or if it was just like the fly is there and that's just where it is. <laughs> Actually, that's, yeah, it's an excellent question. Usually I try to avoid having um, uh, prey in the photographs for a number of reasons. Numerous plants right now are looked at by the public in a lot of cases as, as kind of like a, you know, like a carnival-like curiosity. And it's part of it as like, ooh, we're gonna feed them meal bugs and stuff. This is kind of trying to take it to like, in the realm of like serious art. So usually I do try to keep them from having any uh, prey in the frame. That kind of like, tells you that it's it's blown up, you know. But without the prey, it almost looks like it's going to eat you, the viewer. Yeah. And that's kind of one of the things we're trying to do here. It's like, it's sensual, it kind of draws you in as a viewer, but then also it's frightening, like it's going to come out and attack you. With Matt's talk reaching its conclusion, Jonathan takes the opportunity to introduce himself. And Yvonne meets Matt for the very first time. The New England Cannabis Plant Society uh, yearly shows are always a great time, and to just be part of the whole, the whole energy, the whole you know, activity and, and the whole event, so much fun. You know, it, it was exhausting, but it was also very rewarding, and I just absolutely loved it. Native Exotics in Ithaca, New York, is the East Coast's largest supplier of Nepenthes, the tropical pitcher plants. Owner Ryan Georgia invites us for a tour. Well, it's been a it's been a passion the starting of this business. Uh, I, I personally started out uh, in the hobby when I was about 12 years old. Uh, did some work at Cornell University worked with a few graduate students there, and that sort of uh, fed my uh, interest and, and uh, fueled my, my, uh, my passion for the, for the plants. And over the years, uh, going to uh, college, plant science uh, in Syracuse, um, it just, the ball kept going. Uh, my interest in plant tissue culture uh, expanded, uh, working more with ferns and carnivorous plants as well as orchids uh, in the lab. I decided with a lot of the excess plants that we had from the lab um, that, you know, start selling the plants. And so that, that slowly led to us building this business about five years ago. We have a, a, a lot of customers that, that reach out to us and, and uh, ask questions about growing or, or the interest in getting into, into growing carnivorous plants. And, uh, one, one customer for quite some time of ours that I've actually had the fortune of meeting at the New England Carnivorous Plant Society here this, this uh, September um, is Ivan. Uh, Ivan is a, is a young man who's, who's been interested in these plants for a while now. Uh, started his own collection uh, and I had the, the, the fortune of meeting him at the New England Carnivorous Plant uh, Society show, which is always really nice to meet some of our customers. It's one thing, you know, talking with them over the phone or talking with them through emails. 
but actually getting to see the individual and, and see their passion uh, for the plants, it really reminds me of myself um, and getting into the hobby. Uh, it's really, it's really uh, encouraging, it's, it's exciting to meet people uh, like this, just that human interaction uh, is pretty fantastic. Uh, and I, I really had a, had a good time meeting him and he had a lot of questions about uh, the plants in particular and he's got a lot of similar interests uh, to mine personally. We both like the Highland or Ultra Highland uh, Nepenthes and Nepenthes in general. Uh, and so uh, it was really quite a great experience to, to be able to talk about these plants with another person who enjoys them as much as I do. Uh, we primarily started uh, with an interest in orchids and carnivorous plants, and although it's just such a large group of plants in general, we kind of focused and narrowed down to Nepenthes, as that is something that I've always been passionate about and interested in, uh, you know, a tropical Southeast Asian pitcher plant that uh, produces pitchers that are absolutely enormous, and the, the, the variance uh, uh, in color patterns and morphology of these plants is, is pretty incredible. It just holds a lot of interest with a lot of our customers, new people coming into the hobby, uh, and myself included. I, I think I'll, I'll always be intrigued uh, by these plants. The tropical pitcher plants, or nepenthes, are a genus of vine-forming carnivorous plants found in a number of countries, most notably in Borneo, Sumatra, and the Philippines. At the end of each leaf on the vine is a tendril that can elongate, with the tip developing into a carnivorous pitcher trap. Like its temperate cousins, the Saracenia, Nepenthes pitchers produce a sweet attractant on the underside of the pitcher lid, a slippery peristome that helps prey to fall in, and a waxy pitcher interior to keep insects from escaping. The pitcher also produces a digestive pool that helps to drown and digest captured prey. Nepenthes plants form juvenile or lower pitchers from their earliest leaves. As the plant continues to grow, the newer leaves form upper pitchers, which, in many species, are visually distinct from the pitchers of the younger leaves. Species that are found in nature at elevations below 1,000 meters are referred to as lowland nepenthes and require hot, humid conditions year-round, whereas highland nepenthes, found at higher elevations, require hot, humid days with distinctly cooler nighttime temperatures. Unlike most carnivorous plants, Nepenthes are dioecious, in that individual plants are either male or female, with each gender producing distinct flowers. Yeah, you just gotta yank it the stones. The whole thing kind of shifts. With the tour of the greenhouse completed, Ryan gives us a tour of the remainder of the facilities, including the propagation laboratory. Uh, well, we just visited Ryan George's greenhouse here at Native Exotics in upstate New York, and it was, it's very, it's unbelievable how many different varieties of Nepenthes and other plants he has, and especially seeing his fisiculture lab was pretty cool, uh, and all the new species and all the, all the plants he's propagating. Uh, it's mid-December 2016. It is a balmy 40 degrees out and plunging. Uh, as you can see, I have the plants all wrapped up for the winter. And although the plants are winter hardy, I do this actually to prevent uh, evaporation of the moisture in the trays. It's what they call a frost cloth. It keeps the cold air from actually falling down and freezing the water that's in the trays. Because what happened in the past when I left it exposed is that the water in the trays froze the plants transpired all the moisture out of the pots and they ended up dehydrating and I had an incredible amount of attrition. These plants right now uh, have taken a low of 22 degrees so far inside this greenhouse. So it's a pretty cool little process. I'm very proud of discovering these little things, how I can create these little microenvironments to keep the business going strong. Uh, even at this time of the year, there are still insects flying around. 
I still have insects buzzing around in here. They come in because they think it's sanctuary. <laughs> Little do they know, okay? This is the last place you want to be, okay? Uh, the pitcher plants, I've been cutting them open and looking at their feeding habits. Uh, incredible amount of flies this year. Not so many in the way of moss. Uh, last year, there seemed to be a heavier population of moss. But this is one of those things, you know, it's kind of cool just to play around and see what's going on inside these plants. I did some great educational programs. And one of the last ones that was really phenomenal was working with the 4-H group uh, out in Suffolk County here. The process of the plant. Because what you're actually looking at here is the root structure of the plant. Because the roots do not pull up any food. All the energy is from the insects they trap, and they pull that energy down. Can you guys see that? Take just a couple little roots. And the people that I met there and the children that were involved and this, this organization were absolutely phenomenal. And they have actually embraced this to the point where they want to have a educational garden on the, on, uh, on the grounds there. Get them in there, just gotta wait for them to move. Wasn't that cool? And that's the thing that really got me going this year was the educational programs and the desire to have these for continuing education on the grounds really, really kicked up quite a, quite a lot. Say carnivorous plants. Carnivorous plants. Uh, the sales over the holiday season so far have been phenomenal. Word is getting out. I'm getting incredible emails from people who met me during the course of the season at numerous events that I did. Uh, asking me already to do events starting in February of 2017. It's been a very interesting journey. Uh, as we mentioned in the very beginning, my exposure to the plants through scouting and my parents uh, became a hobby. And uh, when there was a little bit of an economic downfall and I had to figure out, I had to reinvent myself in my landscape design business and find a way to reinvent what I was doing and realizing that the carnivorous plants, which was a hobby, actually could become a form of a livelihood uh, was an interesting decision to make. One that I am glad I made. Uh, it has not been easy. It has been a challenge every single day. If, and this is a commitment. This is not something that you just step into and you throw some plants on the counter uh, like a box store and the people come in and they get it. I love it. I, I, I'm glad that I'm involved in it. It's, not, it's a passion. And I will continue this for as long as I possibly can. Uh, so over the course of a uh, school year, we get, oh, somewhere between 20 and 24,000 students visiting us. We do a lot of uh, workshops with them and uh, use plants as a way of educating them about the world around them. So carnivorous plants are kind of a source of fascination because they certainly are a plant, but in some aspects they kind of act like animals, uh, which trips a weird wire in our brains. Uh, we tend to empathize and sympathize a lot more with animals and notice them a lot more. Carnivorous plant, uh, plants are, uh, are certainly very charismatic in that way, uh, but as you look around the world, there are certainly lots of different examples of various entry points to these scientific practices and content, uh, art, literature, uh, where you can find these entry points throughout. They really help connect these different worlds that the kids see. They think of plants, they think of animals, they think of humans and soil, all in these separate sort of bubbles. And that's really often how we teach it. Um, but we should be teaching it more full circle and connecting those dots between different, you know, ecological systems. Um, and I think that carnivorous plants really help to do that and they really help tie together a lot of these different 
workings that, that come together in a really fascinating way. Just being able to expose children to carnivorous plants, because we live in New York City, we don't really see them out on the street. They're not like dandelions. So to be able to see things that we normally wouldn't see, I think that alone is that great big exposure. And hopefully a couple of years down the line and they get more involved and they look at something that's carnivorous, they can turn around and say, I know that, that a carnivorous plant doesn't use its flower to trap its prey. I know that this plant uses its pitcher to trap its prey. So I think things like that are really what um, I would want people to kind of think about when they think about education and carnivorous plants because there's, they just go hand in hand. There's so many things that we don't know about them yet. So much has yet to be discovered. I think carnivorous plants, they play a huge role in reaching out to new people in that they're a really good way to draw people in. People that might not typically think they like science might hear, oh, there's a carnivorous plant workshop and be like, oh, that's cool, I wanna do that. So then they'll come in and start to learn more and I think it helps widen what people think science is. And I think carnivorous plants are a really great access point that draw in a variety of people. So we've done a number of carnivorous plant programs, which have been hugely popular. Um, it's usually kids and their grown-ups that come along with them. You get to see these kids and they're really focused. We have a very hands-on active audience, so to get our audience to sit still and focus on one thing is really difficult. So these workshops do that and you can just see how into it people are. You see the parents, they're leaning in, they're looking at the plants too, they're holding the magnifiers, they're asking questions. And we love programs that really capture a wider audience. You know, you're getting the kids and you're getting the parents and people are excited and engaged and it's really great. I think what first drew me to carnivorous plants is there's kind of a rebellious aspect to them. They seem to upset the natural order of things. Plants actually wielding power over the lives of animals. Carl Linnaeus, the foremost botanical authority of his time, he refused to believe that the plants were carnivorous because he believed in this hierarchy where plants were put on the earth just to be sustenance for animals. So carnivorous plants are important, I think, because they really make us rethink that animal-centric viewpoint and really look at plants as organisms that are capable of manipulating animals, it really opens your eyes to a new way of looking at the natural world. So the real moments of magic that we see happening in our garden are the aha moments where we see something click in a child's mind and often in an adult's mind. You just see the spark where they see that there's something more to the natural world um, than what you first glance at. And a lot of folks who don't spend a lot of time getting to know plants don't quite appreciate their amazing um, strategies to survive and the kind of unique stories that are behind the science of every plant. There's a lot to be curious about, there's a lot to be learned. Science is ongoing, so we have a lot of interpretation in the garden about the mysteries in the natural world. We really haven't figured everything out about carnivorous plants and how they work and about the rest of the plant world, and there's still so much out there to be discovered. So here at the garden, we're really hoping to generate the next generation of stewards who will just care about nature, take care of it, and help us figure out what else there is to be learned and studied. How else can carnivorous plants affect people's lives? What else can we learn from these captivating plants? Maybe what we can learn isn't defined by science or research. Carnivorous plants confound the expectations of the natural world. Maybe their role is to inspire us to do something as unexpected. Like create art. Or forge a different path. Or bring together a new community or discover something new, or share a story. May carnivorous plants come to captivate and inspire you as they have me and the incredibly generous subjects of this documentary.
and to all who helped make this project possible, my deepest gratitude. Welcome to my organic garden in South Bronx, New York. I have perennials here on the left, and that is one of the reasons why I love these carnivorous plants. They lure in lots of bad bugs, lots of horse flies, a lot of the things that I don't really like. And ever since these have been in my garden, we have noticed a dramatic change in how much that we're bothered by pesky flying insects while we're having barbecues or having some friends over on our patio on the other side of the garden. These are one of my favorite plants of the garden, Saracenus. They're pitcher plants. I have a small Venus fly trap in the front. He's been overwintering for about four years now. He just put off his flowers. This has been thriving here and I'm just gonna let them keep doing their thing. So once again, thank you for checking out my carnivorous plants and I hope everybody enjoyed taking a sneak peek at my garden here in the South Bronx. The International Carnivorous Plant Society wants you to be successful with your plants. We welcome growers just getting started all the way through professional scientists. We started an annual World Carnivorous Plant Day to celebrate these spectacular plants. Take a look around our website and you'll find historic documents about carnivorous plants, growing guides, free educational resources, and more. Have questions? Ask. We don't bite. But our plants do. 